This is CHSR 97.9 FM here in Fredericton, New Brunswick, Canada, and you're listening to Python's Paradise, your film and music show. This is your host, Greg Gilbert, a.k.a. the Python Hyena. And folks, I have a comedian on the phone with me tonight. You know what they say uh, in some of those uh, war movies, we have a comedian in our ranks. (laughs) Well, we got one in our ranks tonight, although we're going to go easy on them. I have Dale Hilton on the phone. How you doing, Dale? I'm doing good. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. Where are you located? Right. Where are you located in LA? No, you're in Kansas, aren't you? I am in Kansas City, uh, right in the center of the map there on the United States. So basically, and, uh, you got uh, like flying houses and tornadoes and witches, <laughs> right? <laughs> we do have that. We. We do have that. It's just almost like a NASCAR race out here. We uh, we look at it as entertainment out here. So we we hold up judge, you know, score signs. Oh, that one was a nine point six. Look at that. Myrtle's cow is in the tree. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's our entertainment around here. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, Steve Joyner, of course. Uh, we 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 met actually today all over the over the over the uh, airlines. But uh, right. Steve Joyner, of course. Uh, uh, you're my second interview through him today, and uh, he sent me a lot of people. Uh, did did he meet you online? Like, I see, it seems to network a lot on social media. Is that how he come to meet you? It, it seems that way. It seems like uh, Steve knows everybody, uh, and and I mean everybody. I mean everybody. Uh, he uh, I met through a friend of mine uh, that knows him and uh, connected us and uh, uh, on the phone, and uh, uh, we hit it off. Uh, well, nice guy. Yeah, I. I uh, my parents. Uh, so. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I come to meet him because I interviewed an actress last uh, year, September, and uh, I'm assuming he must have added me through her. And uh, you know, I figured, well, the actress trusts him, so I'll trust him. And I noticed he posts a lot of stuff I could relate to and whatnot, and I just kind of kept an eye on, see, get a feel of who he was, and. Uh, as I said, in uh, 2015, I did 20 interviews, and last year I did 48. Well, I began this wow. year, yeah, I began this year with Steve Joyner. I, I said, you know, Steve, and c- come on my podcast. I want to get a feel of who you were. And, and it led to um, just an avalanche of uh, guests coming on my show, some of whom I've been familiar with and, and some whom I'm meeting for the first time, such as yourself. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's a, an eclectic group, aren't we? Yep. <laughs> so it's good to meet you. What do you, you you said you're the the uh, hyena python? I'm the python hyena. Python hyena. I'm that's, sorry. Uh, yeah, that's a <laughs> that's an interesting name. Well, I like African wildlife. And uh, I was also, when growing up, I was bullied a lot, and of course, uh, being not popular. Uh, the snake and the hyena are two very unpopular animals, but yet they serve a very big purpose in the environment. And that and the fact that uh, they don't take shit off people either. (laughs) (laughs) There you go. Yeah. All right. That's a good name. Yeah. So I just, I originally just called myself Python, and some people just call me Python. It's Python's paradise. But I kind of threw the hyena in there because I have have a big admiration for the spotted hyena, and I think it's just an amazing animal in its own right. So I kind of just threw that in there. The Python hyena is my. Right. Yep. Although well, I'm in Canada, so. <laughs> right, right. Well, uh, you know, that's kind of a compliment if a girl just says, hey, Python, how you doing? You know, that's a, that's a good nickname for a girl to have. <laughs> If she calls you Python. You know what? I've actually had I've actually had women say, uh, why do they call you Python? Is it because of what's in your pants? <laughs> and I'm not gonna lie to them and say, Well <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. There you know you Yeah. Thanks, but, <laughs> but uh so, so you're a comedian now. How did you get into that? Like, actually, I should say, give us some of your background and what led you to become a comedian. 
Wow, what pushed me over the edge to finally get on this stage was, uh, uh, well, my my whole life people just told me, I was kind of like you, you know, got, got picked on a little bit in school, and so you had to, you know, kind of fight back with words. I was the class clown. Everybody since fourth grade always told me that I should, you know, you ought to be a comedian. And, you know, I kind of there for, you know, I kicked it around for a little, the idea around for a little bit. And then I kind of stumbled uh, on another different path. I ended up uh, working for an, uh, help running an escort service. <laughs> I want to hear uh, about this. <laughs> yeah. And, and during that time, uh, those, the people involved in that business were just very adamant. You need to do comedy. And we had a little trouble with the law. And we were down for about a month. And in that time, uh, I started doing stand-up comedy. Um, uh, and then, uh, you know, uh, we got back together in the, in the business. And I kind of did both for a while. And uh, so I did that for a while. Boss died. The owner died. Didn't continue on with the escort part of it and just went full-time into comedy. Well, you know and, what? Uh, I was going to yeah. say, you know, Rod- Rodney Dangerfield uh, once said, you know, he could not relate to women at all. And speaking of escort service, he said, uh, you know, uh, one time a hooker told him he had a, uh, that she had a headache. <laughs> <laughs> good old Rodney, huh? Yeah, good old, oh, I, 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 good old Rodney. Oh, I I missed him uh, when when he passed away. I I I, I said oh, yeah. so. Some so I, I, when he passed away, I said, you know, now I'm the only one that gets no respect. <laughs> right. <laughs> yep. Rod Rodney yeah. said that uh, Rodney said one time he went to the bookstore and he bought a book, A Thousand Ways to Make Love. He ended up in traction. There was a misprint. <laughs> <laughs> He was so good with one-liners. And I'll tell you another one liners. that was funny too was Stephen Wright. <laughs> oh, he he, his deadpan delivery is is you can't top that. I mean, he's just that he's the best deadpan delivering comic out there that I've seen. Well, he wants. Uh, very- he once, he once said that he once went to the hardware store and bought some used paint that came in the shape of a house. <laughs> he said he also bought some batteries, but they weren't included, so he had to buy them again. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> I, I heard him say one time, he goes, I've got a map of the United States. Or no, I'm sorry, see, I screwed it up. He goes, I have a life-size map of the United States. One mile equals one mile. <laughs> he <laughs> the said, real problem is trying to fold it back together." He he, he said that uh, <laughs> one time he got a tattoo over his whole body of him, but taller. <laughs> <laughs> Who uh, are you some? I love the great, you, you know, the great guys. <clears throat> Before we talk uh, about comedians, I do want to hear a little bit about the escort service because who who doesn't want to hear any of those? Oh yeah, it's, it's, it's whatever. It is. They're like, oh, I'm a comedian. I used to do escorts. Oh, you're a comedian. Ah, tell us about the escort service. Uh, <laughs> trust me. You dude, want me to tell you something? I am trying hard to get... Um, I've always been curious about the subject of cuckolding. You know what cuckolding is, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I've always a... been fascinated with it. I'm not involved with it, but I'm fascinated with it. Uh, I, I think I got uh, really fascinated <laughs> with, with some of these fellas who's, uh, who's uh, I, I hear some of these um, Playboy models or, 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 or uh, women that work in the, the, uh, the strip joints and, and how their male counterparts deal with that, you know, especially ones that are into porn how they deal with that. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's kind of fascinating with me. I've tried to get a couple of cuckold authors on this show <laughs> to promote their okay. books and talk about the subject, and I can't get them to friggin' come on here. And it's like, look, I don't wow. bite. I'm not going to ask you if you're involved, you know. Right. But I want to talk about the subject of your obvious exotica books. I can't get those people to come on here for frig's sake. It, it, it's, 
Uh, I have one person right now is like, give me more time. I need to think about it. I'm like, oh, holy cow. <laughs> uh, maybe maybe you need a girl to ask them and be a lot more demanding. Like, <laughs> you know, have a girl call them up and go, I need you to do an interview now. Come on. You know? <laughs> yeah. Just demand. They'll probably, yes, ma'am. Yes, mistress. And yeah, they'll, they'll probably do that. So here's uh, a question I have about the escort service. Have you? Has there ever been any girls that work there? Where, uh, how, how do their significant others deal with them being involved in that lifestyle? <clears throat> a lot of them were either a single um, or had relationships where that person, you know, they they were just dating somebody, uh, you know, where they didn't live with them. Uh, there was that. The ones that did were in a relationship that knew. Mm-hmm. Um, usually uh, had the element of maybe uh, they were professional about it. You know, okay, they were open-minded enough to where, all right, well, I know what she does. She's making the money. Um, you know, oh, that's, that's the way it is. And that kind of, you know. Uh, then you had other people that were like more of a, I don't want to use the word pimp, um, but they uh, they were a little more aggressive in the relationship and uh, kind of more demanding. Uh, they would uh, make the girl make the girl do all the work, um, you know, and, and actually promote them, you know, to do it. Um, there, there's good sides and bad sides to that, uh, but uh, you know that, that, that it varied it varied like that. And then of course you had the guys that that didn't know and. Uh, when they found out, they, you know, freaked out. But that was really rare. That was really rare. The girls, the, the really good girls uh, kept a, a distance and kept it a low profile. So was there ever any cuckolding situations? Not that I knew Not of. Not that you know of? Um, yeah. I mean, I know if, I mean, that's a, it is an interesting t- a subject. It was there. Uh, there was, uh, I guess, Thinking back on that, uh, there was a couple um, uh, that uh, where the guy, he was just in love with this girl no matter what, and she, you know, kind of took advantage of that and, to, you know, told him, this is how it is, you're going to deal with it, and he was very submissive and was like, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, and uh, I imagine that was going on because he would go on calls with her, so... But I never heard any any details from that as far as that goes. What is one or two of the the strangest uh, stories that you heard of or encountered involved with the escort uh, service? Oh boy, uh, <laughs> <clears throat> I guess you know people will say you know well what you know do they really go out on dates with you and uh, and all that. Uh, or do they really have sex or whatever like that? Well, you have two giant ends of the spectrum as far as, like, a girl paid a guy $250. Excuse me, a guy paid an escort $250. Uh, this was at the time when Pulp Fiction was uh, coming out in the movie theater. Okay. And he paid $250 to see Pulp Fiction with this lady. And you ask one of the strangest, you know, what are one of the strangest things? Another girl, uh, she got paid two hundred and fifty dollars to beat a guy with raw chicken, <laughs> and uh, yeah, so, so uh, I mean, and, and when you know, the girls would go out on these calls, and then they would, you know, they had a fee, uh, so they would come back to the office, the agency, and the I would, they would tell these stories, you know, that, you know about what would happen. Some of them, you know, they would just. Oh yeah, that guy wanted this, or yeah, that guy wanted that, and blah blah blah, you know. And and it was it was a professional thing, you know. It wasn't you know it wasn't weird or creepy. It was just somebody talking about their day at work, and these girls would do that. And so this girl came in to pay, you know, uh, her fee to conduct business. And as she's telling me this, she goes, "Yeah, he wanted me to beat him with the raw chicken." <laughs> and I about fell out of the chair. I just I did I heard it. I had couldn't comprehend it. I'm like, say what? And she said he paid her two hundred and fifty dollars. She didn't have to get naked. 
Uh, he did. Uh, and she just uh, slapped the shit out of him with a, like a, what is it, a, the, the hind quarter of the chicken, the drumstick and the thigh. <laughs> and uh, she beat, slapped the shit out of him with this thing for half an hour and uh, then left. <laughs> you know, and that, that, that yeah. was probably one of the strangest. I've heard a lot more, but I mean, that was probably one of the strangest things I've ever heard. Share a couple more. <laughs> Share a couple more. Yeah, uh, this is just funny. Uh, well, uh, there was uh, a gentleman who uh, they, um, okay, <laughs> they uh, knew this This guy was really upset about his wife br- breaking up with him. He, he was taking it hard and he was, I, I'm trying to, I'm trying to make this a, this is a long story short, but he would pay a lot of money to see an, a girl uh, on uh, some type of, uh, like, a, he would call on Valentine's Day. He wanted to see them on their, like, a wedding day or some type of something like a real special moment, and he would pay extra for their engagement ring. Okay. So uh, this 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 was the, now it's probably not that much of an interesting story, but these girls got wind of what he was doing. So he would call, and he's like, well, I want to see somebody that's getting ready to leave the business, and uh, you know, uh, I'll pay a little extra for her engagement ring. And they're like, "What, really?" And uh, so the girl, <clears throat> excuse me, oh, the girls got wind of this, and they go to like Walmart. I, I, I don't is Walmart in Canada? Do yeah, Walmart's there. Oh yeah. Okay, okay. So wow, they really are that big. Uh, anyway, uh, they go to Walmart, get a thirty dollar ring, charge this guy five hundred dollars. And he'd pay for it, and uh, he was just they, they. It was one of the one of the things that they worked out with this guy, and he would he would pay outlandish amounts of money if he thought it was their engagement ring. Uh, another thing that came to mind that I think is even more funnier. Uh, I'm in Kansas City, and we're we have the Kansas City Chiefs football team. Mm-hmm. And way back a while, this was when I first started, and this was a long time ago when I started. There was a rumor of this thing called caller ID. Okay. So if that dates if that dates me on that one. That's how long ago it was when I started, and I worked there for a long time. Well, anyway, the Kansas City Chiefs. I probably shouldn't say this one, but <laughs> this football team uh, would call us up on, like, say, a Saturday night, and they would have order, or you know, they would want to schedule some of the ladies to go to a hotel room. Uh, downtown because their buddy was in town. Well, that buddy was somebody who was probably on a college team or with them or sometime in the early in their career. Well, now they're on the opposite team that's playing the Chiefs on Sunday. And so, you know, it says, hey, buddy, glad you're in town, man. Uh, here, have a good time. And two escorts show up at his hotel room on a Saturday night. He has a blast. Yeah, Sunday when the game starts, when they got to fight each other, that guy's pooped out and tired. From all the fun that he had the night before, that would happen, and, and that was that was funny when that would happen. <laughs> um, uh, trying to think of some other one. I, I'm I'm getting like an overload here, but uh, stuff like that would happen. You know, we would get a lot of uh, phone calls, uh, and we were we we really tried to keep it classy. Uh, we weren't pimps. We didn't do anything underage. Had nothing to do with drugs. Uh, we you know we wanted to have an element of class and respectability towards it. And we really tried to keep it clean and cool, but these guys would call us up on the phone. And, you know, they'd just be like, just rude. Some of the phone calls we would get were just terrible. <laughs> well, my boss would encourage, you know, normally the customer's not always right. Or the, the customer is always right, not in our business. The customer is not always right. So we had a lot of uh, people that just weren't serious or goofs. And these guys would call us up, and, you know, they'd be like, hey, how much for a blowjob? And, you know, or, or, or what do I get for $50? And I'm like, your mom on the back of the truck, <laughs> you know. And you give it right back to them, you know. Uh, they're just rude like that over the phone. Um, <clears throat> had a lady call me one time. I was answering the phone. And uh, a lady called me. Well, I knew she was a cop because... Um, that just never happened, and later on, uh, found out, yeah, 
I had a female cop try to hit on me. I thought that was funny. Um, and I knew, I knew by the way she was talking that she was up to no good. And uh, so I was having fun with her. That conversation was a little weird. And uh, I also, I drove. Uh, I, I did, uh, I would bounce for bachelor parties. I did a bachelor party, uh, bounce for a bachelor party one time where a girl was wearing uh, spike heeled shoes. Okay. Uh, she's, she's given a lap dance to a guy and, <clears throat> and it was, it was supposed to be 20 people. We get there and there's like 60 oh. and, uh, and, and they were great guys. It was, it was fun, but they just couldn't see. So they kept getting closer and closer. And, you know, they could only get so close. And I'm, I'm standing there right next to her because there's just all these guys, you know, so I had to do something. But they were, they were cool, but they just kept scooting in to see. And one guy got too close, and she, he wasn't even the guy she was giving a dance for. And she hit him in the eye with her spiked heel. Oh. And blood come out of there like a faucet. And she, he, and it was, it was like somebody just stopped and you, it just, everything just went quiet. And, and I, are you all right? And, he, and for a second, he's holding his eye, blood's coming out of his fingers. And there's just this pause. And then he's just like, Woo-hoo! and then they're all like, Woo-hoo! and then just money started raining. And, and here's this guy got blood shooting out of his eye. She's giving a lap dance. This, and that was, that was one of my first, that was one of my first uh, ever jobs with him. And I was like, "Well, this is this is uh, better than construction." Sounds like that scene <laughs> out a single white female. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's a, yeah. That's I've heard that reference a lot. Yeah, and that's pretty much what it was like. Um, but a lot of fun. Had a lot of fun uh, doing it. Did it uh, for uh, right about uh, sixteen, seventeen years. And I'd probably still be doing it, but the, just the guy that owned it, he died. And that, that was pretty much it. And uh, I didn't have the money to keep it going. But uh, went to comedy after that. Uh, Before I bring up the comedy, I wanted to bring up something funny. <clears throat> okay. You know when I brought up the cuckolding? <laughs> you know, I didn't even know what that term was until uh, I was fighting with this. Uh, I come from a Christian household. And I got no problem with my beliefs. I don't force it on other people. But boy, I was in a confrontation with this group of Christian film critics in uh, Los Angeles who I think are the biggest bunch of uh, hypocritical assholes on the planet. But um, mm-hmm. they would give uh, low uh, star ratings to movies they claim that are immoral. Well... They gave a four-star rating to this piece of shit called Fireproof, starring Kirk Cameron. And boy, reading their review, they were talking about Kirk like he was Marlon Brando. I watched the movie. I thought it was predictable. Uh, It was, uh, I'd say, Lifetime movies uh, look like Oscar winners in comparison. (laughs) But yeah, it's about Kirk Cameron playing this fireman whose uh, wife, who's a nurse, uh, they're growing distance from each other, you know, and uh, it's all very tame. Uh, there's no challenge, but I guess uh, there's this hint that uh, a doctor that she works with is uh, um, trying to uh, make the moves on her, and of course it's done very tame. But then uh, partway through the movie, you know, when when um, uh, they reveal that the doctor's going to uh, fix things with his wife. They reveal that him p- pulling a wedding ring out of his drawer. And I'm like, you kidding me? How cheap is this? And I thought, wouldn't it be interesting had uh, the filmmakers, rather than preach to people, why not try to reach a broader audience? And you don't have to show anything, but why not challenge the audience and let them think that maybe the possibility that this woman might have cheated and then cleverly reveal that she didn't? rather than make things so plain and simple for the preaching to the choir audience. And I got thinking about that, that whole thing about the guy making the moves on Kirk Cameron's wife in the movie, Aaron Bathia. And I was like, that's what got me thinking about cuckolding. And I never knew, even knew what the word was. And they want to uh, criticize movies. They b- blame movies for violence. 
Well, I could easily say that uh, any interest I have in cuckolding came from Fireproof, couldn't I? <laughs> <laughs> well, I bet- yeah, uh, you, you, that's that's probably not a point they're going to want to uh, agree with. You well, know, well, they're going to have to because I'd be more than happy to plant that point. On the uh, the foot of my uh, t- toe of my foot and plant it right up their ass. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like that group of people. I think I think they're just scum, you know. But um, that that was where I first. Uh, uh, I guess I just kind of looked into it, and that is where that uh, come from. Came from a Christian movie and a really bad one at that. <laughs> But, yeah, uh, I uh, have not uh, taken the time to uh, see that movie. Um, I, uh, I have, you're the first review I've heard on it, but as far as uh, Kirk Cameron goes, I uh, can't say that I'm a strong fan of his acting. Nope. So, uh, <laughs> I tend to be a little. Uh, I, I do like the. Uh, you know, come on. You know, I like the the violent movies. I mean, then yep. anybody with common sense. You know, I grew up on Tom and Jerry, and they're beating each other with hammers. Well, there. Were, I know, guess there was a, 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 a riot in Baltimore or something like that, and this stupid group of Christian film critics uh, were blaming it on the purge, and they said, if you donate to them, uh, they'll prevent this from happening again. Are you like really? <laughs> That's yeah. about the same as me watching National Lampoon's Animal House and seeing John Belushi taking the piss at the beginning of the film while he's drunk, <laughs> and me going out, and I don't drink, but nonetheless going out and, and pissing uh, on the side of somebody's uh, uh, bushes and then uh, blaming it on uh, John Belushi. <laughs> right, right. It just yeah. uh, doesn't make sense, you know? But they're trying to bring the the haze code back, and I'm like, over my dead body, you're gonna bring. They're, they're not coming into my house and tell me what I can and can't not watch. Right, right. I mean, they, they you know, they, when they when they try to get like that, don't tell me what I can and can't watch. You know, let me decide for myself. You know, I think Kirk Cameron's acting is more offensive than some of the stuff that, that they have out there. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yeah, I, I there. I said it. I said it out there. You know. Good. Uh, yep. But uh, um, yeah. Uh, I, I don't. I don't like that. You know. I mean, this still. It's still free. You know. I still got the choice to choose what I want. I don't. You know. Want to watch? Don't. Don't criticize me because I want to watch Goodfellas. Exactly. You know? Yeah. And uh, that's that's just a great. It's real. Those Kirk Cameron movies and some of those movies aren't real. You know. Maybe it is to those people. Because maybe that's the way they act around other people, but you know when they're home alone, who knows how they act? But well, you know just, what? In you know, my collection home, I've I've got the Passion of the Christ home. I thought it was a great movie, but you know what? I also had Taxi Driver. I've got Pulp Fiction. You know, <laughs> right, right. I, I like good right. filmmaking too. You know, <clears throat> well, they talk about violence in movies, man. You know, look at the passion in the passage of the Christ, you know, passions of the Christ. They beat, you know, wore him out, you know, and talk yep. about violence, you yep. know, and, uh, but yeah, those are great movies. That's, that's a good reference to passions of the Christ and taxi driver. Yep. Well, I, I thought the passion was actually, I, I wish all faith based movies, Christian movies were done as well as the passion. Then maybe they might have an argument, but I'm sorry. There's eons uh, between Mel Gibson as a filmmaker and and the Kendrick brothers, who I don't even think should pick up a camera. But uh, who do I know? <laughs> but you were know, they, we're, were they the ones that did the Kirk Cameron movie? Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. All right. I didn't mind <laughs> Courageous so much, you know, but Fireproof. I just thought, yeah, like they didn't challenge at all. And of course. Uh, I'm just gonna call them out, movie guide. I I I, I think I can't stand them. I, I they're a group that, uh, as far as I'm concerned, their views are ludicrous to me. But uh, nonetheless, yeah. you're a comedian, and I I just want to know um, who are some of your favorite comedians, past and present. Uh, definitely the guy who got the ball rolling for me when I, was, I remember I was a little kid, George Carlin. Oh, good choice. Uh, George Carl. I was, I, I, I just remember I was waiting for, uh, the $6 million man to come on. Okay. And right, be- right before that was another show was, uh, I think it was laughing or something. 
and there's this guy standing there. He's got long hair, and he says, I'm not getting on the plane. I'm getting in the plane. And even as a little kid, I got it. And I was like, wow, that's funny. And I, I said, Mom, you know, what's the deal with this guy? What, is, what does he do? And my mom explained that he's a guy that stands there and tells jokes. And right then and there, I'm like, well, that's for me. I want to do that, you know. Took a, took a turn when I got older, but uh, uh, that's my inspiration. Definitely Sam Kennison. Oh, I love Sam. Sam was the... <laughs> Oh, didn't you love him? Didn't you love him in Back to School playing a professor? Could you imagine him <laughs> playing a professor? Uh, yeah, he would have been. I would have definitely learned a lot in his class. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I learned a lot from his comedy. Uh, yeah, I I, uh, I got to see him right before he he uh, passed. And uh, oh, did you tell me about yeah, that? Yeah, I, I was. That was that was so. So I, to this day, to this day, I've done comedy. I've seen a lot of comedy. I've seen some really good shows. But man, Kennison, that was that was a tough one to beat. Uh, I laughed until I felt pain. <laughs> and uh, uh, just I was I was and looking back, I felt I'm I'm lucky. I'm I am lucky to have seen him live. And uh, you know, there's you know, of course, anybody can see his stuff on the internet, but uh, you know, to really get that live feeling. You know that was that was intense. Yeah. Uh, as far as uh, and also Richard Pryor, I want to throw one out to Richard Pryor. Uh, and as far as uh, new comics, uh, dang Bill Burr, boy, he just makes me want to throw the mic down on the floor. Who is you know, it? Uh, Bill Burr. Oh, okay. Uh, Bill Burr, um, and uh, I I got to admit I really enjoyed Dave Chappelle's new new special that he just came out. Oh, I like Dave, um, yeah. Yeah, uh, but uh, I guess as far as uh, newer comics today, Bill Burr and Dave Chappelle, I, there's a lot of good ones. You know, I'm not, I'm not saying anything about anybody else, but those those are my, probably my two. Those are the guys I look at them and I just shake my head and I'm like, damn. Boy, Sam Kennison you know? had a lot to say about marriage. <laughs> sure. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All I could think of is when he just screams in that guy's face, you know, this, oh, you're married? Oh, this is what's going to happen. Look at this face. And he just starts screaming in that guy's face. Ow, ow, you know, and, uh, it was a terrible Sam impersonation, by the way. But, uh, yeah, he, he really had a hard time with marriage. And was when he was killed, he was on the honeymoon of his third marriage, I believe. Yeah. Ironic. He, wasn't he hit by a drunk driver? That's what I heard. You know um, what's ironic is oh, I remember uh-huh. an act he did where he goes, uh, he goes, it's Thursday night. Everybody's gonna act like it's Friday night because none of us are going home tonight. F it. He goes. Yeah. He goes like. Um, he goes. Uh, he goes. Don't. F and drink and drive. Man, they've made such a big F and deal about this. <laughs> it never used to be such a big F and deal. You had a few drinks. You went home. Now you're a dick. Now you're an F and asshole. Child killer. Child like, killer. Child killer. Like you're walking out to the car thinking, I hope I fly into a, uh, a bet check and slide into a family of six tonight. <laughs> yeah. and, and it's funny, but yet it's offensive. But yet the same token, there's something very truthful about it as well. And yet he yeah. got hit by a drunk driver. Yeah, it was very ironic. Um, he spoke the truth on that. You know, yeah. He spoke the truth, you know. But... And, he, and he's totally right about it. And sometimes the truth, sometimes the truth hurts. Uh, propane. Uh, so that uh, he did that, but then to get actually, you know, get killed that way. And of course, Richard uh, Pryor, you're always thinking about him free face and cocaine. Oh yeah. <laughs> What's the George Carlin had a line? He's like, I currently lead Richard Pryor in heart attacks two to one. <laughs> However. He has me beat by setting oneself on fire. Something <laughs> I don't know. This is how he said it. And, uh, that was George Carlin's joke and, about and Richard. G- and George Carlin had the seven words you can't say on television, mm-hmm. yet you hear them all the time now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's all watered down now, you know. Um, 
you couldn't say those things on television. Well, now on the internet, you know, you, you, that's that that's a channel. You know, those seven words. You know, um, it, it was a good bit for the time. You know, and I think it kind of set the stage for the acceptance of those words now. Oh, George you know. was brilliant. Oh yeah, he, he, yeah. Um, I could I could go on and on about about George Carlin. You were, yeah. I want to go back real quick. You you were mentioning Rodney Dangerfield earlier. Yeah, I like Rodney. One of the I got, I think it was when I was a kid. I got that album that he did rapping Rodney. Okay. And, and okay, I was like I don't know ten or eleven. <laughs> And but on see the the it was all the radio friendly stuff and all the the happy happy family joy joy, whatever, on the side a rapping Rodney and it's all that, well and my mom was okay with that so she was cool, what no one really noticed is on side B was like his his like other stuff, <laughs> and I was like you know I was a little kid, and there's the, he's like oh, okay uh, let's uh take some questions from the audience and. Uh, some guy in the crowd goes, how big, I, I hope I can say this. Go, go ahead, go is, ahead. He goes, how big is your dick? And Rodney goes, I don't know. Uh, open your mouth and let's find out. <laughs> and I had never had that concept in my life at that young of an age. So I was totally blown away by the thought of somebody putting a, a dick in somebody else's mouth, let alone another guy. You know, it was like, ah, whoa, wow. I was just totally blown away by that. By that, by Rodney Dangerfield. So I hate to say it, that Rodney Dangerfield, you know, kind of in a way told me about blowjobs. You know, <laughs> did you share that with your folks? Uh, not until I was a lot older. And uh, <laughs> you say you, you, you listen to this side B, ma. Yeah, glad you haven't heard side B, ma. I learned a lot. <laughs> Let's get the Sam Kennison one now. <laughs> right, time for Sam. <laughs> Learn about marriage. <laughs> Yeah, comedians are some good teachers, okay? <laughs> Richard Pryor will teach us about drug use. <laughs> right. Well, and then there's how Ed, to do cocaine, how, uh, to, how to smoke cocaine. And then there's Eddie Murphy, who did some just brilliant oh. Uh, impressions. Oh, man. Eddie was, um, when I was in eighth grade, our science teacher, he, he just didn't care anymore. He just wanted everybody to be quiet, and uh, he uh, let us listen to whatever we wanted to. And so I was getting an A in science class. I have no idea. I don't even know how to spell science correctly. <laughs> and uh, so we would listen to Eddie Murphy when he came out with Delirious uh, in eighth grade in school. So we were listening to the Del to the Delirious album in school in science class. And you talk about hilarious, and then hearing all his impersonations, uh, how he did. I'm in school, again, learning from another comedian. I learned a lot of my timing, or, you know, un unbeknownst to me now, I guess I kind of got a little bit of his timing uh, by listening to uh, Del Delirious and Raw. Uh, but that album, if anybody out there is uh, listening right now and has not heard the Eddie Murphy Delirious album, that is a must little outdated on some of the material, but hilarious. Yeah. Uh, I'm talking about the honeymooners, <laughs> you know, kids today are like the honeymooners. Who's, you know, who's Ralph Cramden, you know, uh, he did a great, great impersonation. And Elvis, man, yep. Eddie Murphy's Elvis impersonation was great. I, I liked it when he did uh, James Brown. <laughs> oh, oh yeah. Hi, you know, <laughs> that's a James Brown lyric. <laughs> <laughs> we turned the record back and said, what the F did I just miss? <laughs> right. right. His, his impersonations of James Brown made young white boys want to go listen to James Brown. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then I there, know I did. And then there's Robin Williams, another one. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You, yeah. Yeah. Robin Williams. Uh what an amazing what an amazing comic mm -hmm. um, uh, it's a uh, very sad very sad and unexpected ending on him um, but uh, I 
I uh, did a jo- I had a joke one time that I I came up with, and uh, I was doing it, and I had just started doing this joke, and then Robin Williams came out with a special, okay. about six months later, something like that, and uh, me and a buddy of mine are, who was not a comedian, we we watched it, and in the middle. Robin Williams starts doing this joke that's almost word, pretty much word for word verbatim. Only he did a he did kind of a he he did a little twist to it, and my friend's like, "Wow, man, Robin Williams stole your joke!" And I'm like, just started, oh man, I'm like, he didn't steal my job. I'm, I'm not saying that at all. I kind of put it down a great minds think alike. And, yeah. uh, uh, but, uh, I had to, I immediately stopped doing it cause I didn't want anybody to think that I was stealing from Robin Williams, Yeah, you know? And, uh, that was, that was kind of a kick in the, kick in the gut there on that one. Cause it was a funny joke. And, um, but you know, that's just what strength strengthens you as a comic. Okay. Well, you know, I'll just have to write another one. Well, you, you know, know what? Something that came out of Robin Williams death. You remember the ice bucket challenge? Yes. Yeah. Well, after Robin Williams passed away, another challenge uh, surfaced called the Doubtfire Face Challenge for Suicide Depression. And, uh, it, yeah, it involved taking a pie in the face and you nominate three people in, in, in support of suicide and depression awareness. Wow. Why did that get promoted? It, was, I, I, it came out a couple help? years ago, and I originally had done one, and uh, I really wanted to read... Well, I'll I tell you one person I wanted to get to do it was Emma Stone, because I'm a big Emma Stone fan. She's got a comic disposition for it to her, but I think I might have been aiming too high, and I hope eventually maybe it might get around to her. <laughs> or, but I, I, did, I did another one, and I, um, I challenged people I interviewed... And, uh, oh, yeah, okay. and, 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 uh, I had an actress out of Canada who's living in the States, but, uh, uh, Lisa Lang was of the film class of 1984. She accepted the challenge and I thought, wow, you know, and, uh, and she had called me and, uh, wanted the details on it and she did it. And, uh, Nancy McLaughlin, who was in Friday the 13th part six, Jason lives, uh, she did it. <laughs> yeah. And, wow. Okay. Yeah. And, All right. Uh, and I had uh, um, I I know I've got uh, a bunch of others that are set to do it, but I've been kind of throwing that out there because I I figure uh, if uh, the ice bucket challenge can go viral and do all that uh, uh, do bringing all that money to help for ALS, I was like, why can't we do the same? Uh, with other charities, you know, especially since it's kind of fun to watch that stuff. And quite frankly, I think a pie in the face is a lot more fun to watch than ice bucket. Cause I could just stand <laughs> under a, a cold shower and it's the same thing. Yeah. I was like, okay, everybody's doing this at winter t- or on the summertime. And I, I, and I did it too. Uh, I, I, I had a bulldozer dump a bunch of water on me. Um, and I thought I was being original and I was like, wow. And then I got online like two minutes later, I see everybody else. There's like all kinds of other people that did it with bulldozers, but it's in the summertime and the, uh, it's ice water. That's not a challenge. That's a, that's a refreshment, you know, uh, uh, and a pot. Okay. I have a very thick, long goatee. And I can tell you right now that a pie in the, I've all, you know, when the three stooges and they get in a pie fight, that's great. I'm a big fan of a pie fight, you know, mm-hmm. but getting big pie out of your beard, that's a challenge. <laughs> that's a one challenge. of my favorite, <laughs> one of my all time favorite pie fights was in the great race. And I'll tell you why it was good. You had some good comedic actors like Jack Lemon and Tony Curtis and people like that in it. But the pie fight would have been nothing without the presence of the elegant, beautiful Natalie Wood. <laughs> Yeah. Good boy. That's a great race. That, race or the mad, mad, mad? No, it's a great race. That's right. Okay. All right. <laughs> Natalie Wood, yeah, she, boy, she was smoking hot in her time. And she got plastered. 
and she was dressed in all these really fancy clothes. And to me, it's what made the pie fight work. <laughs> she did the first pie bukkake. Can can you say that on the air? I, I hope not. I, or I hope uh, I didn't. Go ahead. I mean, when this goes on the internet, who cares? <laughs> okay. And she, Natalie Wood, she did the first pie bukkake. Uh, and, I, and I mean that with the greatest respect. <laughs> I like Natalie Wood, and I love pie. And uh, <laughs> she would make a great pie pan, and I mean that in all kinds of different ways. Uh, yeah, but no, I've been throwing that challenge out, you know, if there anybody that wanted to do it. But I kind of thought of it when when Robin Williams was brought up, because uh, I um, nobody knew that he was suffering from uh, right depression, you know, and. Uh, it just kind of came as a shock. Like he didn't die naturally yeah. like Don Rickles, you know? Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And yeah. Oh, yeah. Rest in peace, Don Rickles and Robin Williams. Yeah. There was comedians, uh, you know, were, <laughs> have been known, have been known to be sad people, you know? Yeah. Um, we, we're, uh, we make a lot of people laugh. You know, and, and he's not the only one to, uh, there's a lot of comedians have committed suicide. Uh, you know, some, uh, I, I, I know a couple that aren't, aren't big names as Robin Williams, but, uh, you know, that's, uh, it seems to be a sad end to a lot of comedy careers. Go back to Sam Kennison. Yeah. Um, what do you think of Andrew Dice Clay? I mean, he's kind of on the dirty level of Sam Kennison. Uh, I've always liked the Dice Man. He's, you know, he's always, I, I liked him. Uh, I thought just, I, I, I liked Sam better just because uh, here, yeah. his, his, his material was a little more realistic. I mean. Yeah, you learn a lot about marriage, you know. That's why I yeah, stayed single. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, you learn a lot about marriage and, uh, you know, other uh other things that he used to teach, uh, <laughs> I won't go into it on there. It's a little dirty, but uh, uh, but uh, the Dice Man and the Dice Play. I mean, his he just rewrote uh, dirty nursery rhymes. You know, he just rewrote the nursery. Well, that's silly. You know, I mean, he's a high level of silly to me. And some of his material was a little, uh, you know, it's like he was attacking people. You know, on on purpose. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, other than that, he was at East Coast. You know, hey, oh, you know, uh, he was—that's his style. You know, I'm not really bagging on the guy, but I got to say, I like Sam Kennison a little better. There'll um, never be another Sam. No, no, and no, there won't. And and I—I uh, I also like Bobcat. Oh yeah, I love, but I. It was upsetting because I liked both Sam and Bobcat. And so I, they had a beef with each other. So it was like, oh, man, I wish those guys would get along. That'd be a great show. Yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, I, and I got to actually work with Bobcat. And uh, what a nice guy. What a great guy he is. And, and I'm not trying to, you know, kiss up to anybody. It was just, I was, you know, wow. I remember him watching him before I got to do comedy. I think that the Police Academy movies went really downhill after he left. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. I He was one of the stronger points, one of the stronger characters of that whole series. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and and it was such a, a memorable character, you know. And uh, and so when you say Bobcat, you got to cut. Some people are like, who? Yeah, Bobcat goes late. you got to bring up yeah. that character, and they're like, oh, yeah, that guy, yeah. And then, of course, they, does he really talk that way? And I'm like, no, not at all. And uh, uh, you can see it when he goes up on stage now. He doesn't do that act, but he'll get excited. You can see it. And so a little bit of that act will come out. You can, you'll, you know, he'll snort or whatever like he does when he used to. But, uh, but other than that, well, he was a really nice guy. And I knew that he, him and Sam had a beef, but I didn't want to bring it up. You know, no. I, was just a young, I was just a young comic, got to work with one of my heroes, you know. What's and, uh, Sam doing, or not Sam, uh, what's Bobcat doing now, do you know? He is producing, uh, and you bring up Robin Williams, he brought up, uh, he produced, I believe he produced, 
uh, maybe directed. I, I, I know he produced or had something to do with uh, World's Greatest Dad okay. with Robin Williams. And uh, actually did a scene with him, the little cameo. I, I, I apologize. I can't remember if he produced or directed uh, but I know he was uh, a big part of uh, making that movie, and that's what. And I think he p- produces the Jimmy Kimmel show. I oh think really? Yeah, I think he has something to do with the Jimmy Kimmel show. Again, I, I apologize. I don't know exactly what it is, but I know he's a big part of it, or or was. And uh, that's what he's doing. Uh, I I know he do, still does uh, his uh, act occasionally. Is he embarrassed with Hot the Trot? <laughs> that's something you can ask him. Uh, that'll be on next week's episode. Uh, uh, that's something you could ask him. I don't know. He does. Uh, he does make fun of. He, he jabs on himself a little bit on certain things. I wonder if I could yeah. get him on here. I don't. I've never. I've thought of him in a while. Well, I, I can tell you, he's a very nice guy. Um, very down to earth. He was. A, he was like an old soul. Yeah, you know, I, I felt like I, you know, I could just sit down and talk to him about with that dude about anything, you know, because he he was just that laid back and cool, you know, and all, and some people are like, does he do drugs, man? I'm like, no, man, he ain't like that, and uh, he he he's just a just a nice guy, and um, what oddly, I don't I I hope we had, I also got a chance to, and I have to say, uh, I did comedy. With Ron Jeremy. Okay. Okay. I, I, it's, I, I, got to, I had to learn quick that I said, oh, yeah, I worked with Ron Jeremy. And they're like, really? Were you in a porno with Ron Jeremy? Because that's the one I do not want to see. Well, you uh, were part of an escort <laughs> service. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and thing is, uh, I don't know if anybody remembers the uh, uh, adult, adult film star Seika. Well, who is uh, it? Seika? No. Oh. Aka, early porn star. Uh, she had she was the one that always had the short blonde hair, and uh, they they said that uh, when it come if there was a Mount Rushmore of porn that she would be she would be on there. Uh, I, her and Ron Jeremy are friends, obviously. Okay. And she, anyway, she lives. She I'm friends with her. She lives in Kansas City. An extremely nice lady. Uh, nice lady. Wonderful cook. Um, but I, when I, he was doing comedy, he was doing comedy here in Kansas city, obviously. Well, I was, I was trying to, it, it was weird. Cause I ended up here. I am working with <laughs> doing stand up comedy with Ron Jeremy and trying to get a hold of Seika. She actually called me. She's like, Hey, where's the address? I gave her the address. And for some reason she wasn't able to show up or something, but Ron Jeremy was actually a little bummed out. He was like, Oh man, that's my friend. You know, I wanted to say hi. And <laughs> Cause he was a, he was a super nice guy too, uh, a gentleman, very nice guy. It was just strange working with him because uh, he wanted to go on first. Okay. And uh, uh, usually the big name, you know, goes on last. And well, he wanted to be the MC. And um, so they, uh, I ended up getting the the spot after him on the show. And then there was another comedian, a headliner, and uh, so I, it was. It was like, wow, I have to follow Ron Jeremy. Ron Jeremy, and he was out there just killing. And uh, what I didn't know is his closing bit was the, you know, my penis is so big. <laughs> how big is it? And uh, I didn't know that for the first show. I did two shows with him. And we were in the green room. I couldn't hear him. I was trying to hear him. So he when he introduced my name, and there's this commotion going on in the in the green room. So I was trying to listen to him, but I couldn't tell what his closing joke was. So I finally, and he's what what I found out later. He's doing these my dick is so big, how big is it jokes. Well, it finally gets done. Everybody's clapping. Ron Jeremy's over, and he introduces me. I come out on stage. My opening line, and to keep again, I didn't know what his last joke was. My opening line was, hi, everybody, I'm Ron Jeremy's dick. <laughs> and the place lit up. It was, it, was a, it, was, it was pretty cool, and he liked that. He thought it was funny. And uh, 
but uh, another good guy to to do comedy with. And I hope I didn't burn up too much time on that one. No, it's okay. You know, no, we're doing fine on time. Another okay. comedian I thought of too who was really brilliant was Steve Martin. Oh, do you know Steve Martin? In the comedy clubs, there's always a two shows on Friday, two shows on Saturday. Rumor has it that the reason Steve Martin quit doing stand-up comedy, they say, hey, why did you quit doing stand-up comedy? And his answer is, second show Friday. And being in comedy and knowing, I know exactly what he's talking about. Um He's also, I, if I think, he's gotten awards for banjo playing. Oh, yeah, he has. He's like the speed metal of the banjo. Yep. And, um, uh, but yeah, he's a, he was one of my first ones. I'm a wild and crazy guy. Yep. I remember when he was on Saturday Night Live. He's a good guy. Did you have any favorite Saturday Night Live comedians? Oh, Eddie Murphy. Yeah. Um... I guess out of all those, I like Joe Piscopo for a while, but whatever happened to that guy? Um, uh, oh, what's John Belushi? Uh, John, yeah, John Belushi. Um, he was more of a comedic actor. I liked him. Um, yeah, he, definitely him. Chevy Chase. Um, Chevy Chase was good. He he was good. Bill Murray. Uh, Eddie Murphy. Bill Murray is the his the greatest cameo in any movie ever in my opinion is his cameo in Zombieland. Oh yeah. <laughs> that was beautiful. I love the Garfield spoiler. remark too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Spoiler alert for anybody who hasn't seen Zombieland. Bill Murray's in it. He plays himself. He gets shot in the chest. He's dying and he goes, do you have anything you want to say? He goes, well, I, I, I don't have any regrets. Well, except for maybe Garfield. Oh. Uh, <laughs> I cried laughing. I was like, that's that's the greatest cameo ever. And Dan Aykroyd, of course, I met him when he did a wine signing uh, here in town. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah, I liked a uh, lot of those early uh, Saturday Night Live uh, uh, comedians. Today, I, I really like Kate McKinnon a lot. Honestly, I've never... never uh... I apologize. Never heard of the, uh, her. Kate, of her. Kate McKinnon was in the new Ghostbusters. She was also in Office oh. Christmas Party. Um, I should know her then. I should know her. Yeah, she, uh, she was in Office Christmas Party. <coughs> Excuse me. And, uh, oh, gee, she's in a bunch of stuff. I think she's hyster hysterical. I so, haven't seen the new Ghostbusters movie or, or the other movie. Um and uh, so I've been a little out of touch on that. Uh, but, yeah, I, I, uh, I'm sure she's funny. It's oh, I think she's hilarious, yeah. A big part of that, yeah. Yeah. But uh, you also, though, um, have mentioned on the phone, uh, we were talking about Canada. And you know where I'm located here in New Brunswick, Canada? I always have to ask. Is that on the East Coast, kind of by, would that say Niagara Falls? Well, well, we're up around uh, where Nova Scotia and Halifax are. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I always uh, I always tell people about the closest we have to comedians uh, or celebrities are the Trailer Park Boys. Please tell me you know who they are. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Trailer Park Boys. Those guys are good. I think they're uh, hilarious. <laughs> yeah. Uh, where were the McKenzie brothers from? I mean, I mean, I know they were Canada, but uh, where, where, what part of Canada were they from? I don't know. Oh, th th they were hilarious, too. Yeah. Oh, McKenzie Bob Brothers. and Doug McKenzie, uh, that movie uh -huh. Strange Brew. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I think that was oh, from uh, SCTV or something like that. I know that's where uh, I think Rick Moranis and uh, Dave Thomas came from. Yeah, that's where they came from. I think those two characters got started on that show. Uh, that was uh, Canada's version of Saturday Night Live. Beauty, eh? Uh, uh, the, the SCTV. Yeah. Uh, that was, uh, I remember for a while they would put that on after, like, Saturday Night Live. 
here in the Midwest. So we would watch Saturday Night Live, and then later on it was SCTV. Of course, we were Midwest guys. We're like, what is this Canada stuff? <laughs> oh, that's kind of funny. But I, what are, they talk funny. And uh, <laughs> and then people hear us talk, and they're like, well, you talk funny too. So <laughs> I want to I want to quote uh, Craig Ferguson. Okay. Uh, this is his this is his joke about Canada. Okay. Uh, any anybody laughing at this, this this is all Craig Ferguson's laughs, but I think this is the funniest thing I've ever heard about Canada. He said Canadians are some of the nicest people in the world until you put a hockey stick in their hand. <laughs> <laughs> And I think hockey is a cool sport, so but they don't have it in Kansas, that's for sure. Uh, they they've tried it, but not a lot of ice out here. And uh, but uh, yeah, uh, that's that's my favorite joke about Canadians. There's a lot of uh, great comedians come out to SCTV. I mean, of course, John Candy was a was a, a major one. Oh, oh yeah, uh, John Candy, Tommy Chong. Tom John, Canada, um, Eugene Levy, mm-hmm. and Catherine O'Hara. Mm-hmm. Catherine O'Hara, of course, was the really hot mom in uh, Home Alone. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That gorgeous red hair. But um, Eugene Levy, for me, is American Pie all the way. <laughs> Have you seen the new show that he's in? Uh, oh, up she- uh, Sheets Creek or something like that. Yeah. Oh yeah, I've seen yeah. Bit, I've seen I've seen bits and pieces of it. Yeah. He's he's hilarious in that. He's good in everything he does. Did you see American yeah, Pie? Yes. I thought I, I'd never <laughs> seen that before. A father that prom- promiscuous <laughs> with right. a son. I just thought that was great when. Um, when uh, I, like I remember the audience, there's this moment in some of these movies uh, where you see something you just never seen before, and you got Jason Biggs up on that counter, uh, humping that pie, and friggin' uh, <laughs> Eugene Levy walks in, and he goes, "Son," he goes, "Dad," and then you see them sitting on the table. That pie is just mangled, the apple pie, and. Uh, <laughs> Uh, friggin' Jason Biggs. I mean, this is his. This is what he's remembered for. As we as we see, uh, uh, Jay and Silent Bob Strikes Back. He's the pie effer. <laughs> uh, but I, I, I love the delivery from Eugene Levy. We'll just tell your mother that we ate it all. <laughs> <laughs> and I love that they're sitting there in the hallway in front of the picture. You know, they're what, look family po- photos, and he, he's talking about what a great time that was, and he. <laughs> he takes uh, Jason Biggs aside and goes, I'd like to talk to you about masturbation. <laughs> 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 uh, I, I just thought Eugene Levy stole the whole movie because it was he just. He really did. Yeah. One of the stronger characters for sure. Yeah. Uh, very funny movie. But you. Uh, I'm, glad they, I'm glad they kept him in all of them. <laughs> I take it you watched <laughs> them all. No. Not all of them. <laughs> I was, I was, uh, and speaking, I was too busy writing my own American Pie movie. So, and, spe- and speaking uh, of American Pie and hockey, you mentioned hockey, of course. Sean William Scott, who played Stifler in American Pie, was in the Goon movies, which were, which were Canadian uh, made. The, the, the second Goon movie I thought was exceptionally good, too. Um, I don't think you're familiar with those. Uh, Goon? Are you talking about Goonies or Goon? No, Goon. It's called Goon. It was, uh, okay. yeah, it uh, shot here in Canada. Okay. Yes, Canadian uh, film. I guess, by the way, you Canadians make some good movies. I will say that. That's, okay, tell us about I some just, of our good movies. Uh, I like Blade. Wasn't that, wasn't that ca- Canadian? Or oh, Blade 3. Okay, those were you shit. Know, that's not the one I was thinking you were going to say. Uh, I... Uh, um, I, I can't remember. There's a vampire movie. Oh, uh, there's a vampire movie that was really cool that I liked, and I, I thought it was Blade Three. But there's another movie, and I think they're Canadian directors, but it's about a Canadian punk. It's fictional. And it's called Hardcore Logo. 
Okay. And uh, uh, one of the guys that's in Blade 3 is in Hardcore Logo. And one of the guys that's in that show, uh, the unit, not the unit, uh, some kind of, ah, heck, I don't even know what I'm talking about now. Some kind of SWAT show. And one of the guys, anyway, there's a movie called Hardcore Logo. Yeah, I'm familiar a, with that. It's a, it's a, you do? I'm familiar with that. I didn't know it was Canadian, but then again, you know, I, I haven't, I haven't seen that movie, so I don't know a whole lot about it. Um, it's, it's just about some, uh, 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 uh punk band. Okay. It's a fictional punk band that goes on tour through Canada. And, uh, I learned a lot about my, uh, I learned a little, uh, Canadian geography, uh, by watching that movie. And, uh, uh, but that's a great movie. It's a little underground movie. Uh, if you like punk rock and surprise endings and, you know, it's, it's like a, Kind of like a Spinal Tap, but okay. uh, not. It's. It, I would say it's uh, Canada's version of Spinal Tap, but a little more hardcore. Uh, but uh, I, I really like that. As far as Canada movies goes, uh, kind of an obscure one, but uh, good movie. I like Class of 1984. That's one of my favorite Canadian films. And Bon Cop, Bad Cop. <laughs> that was what? what cop, bad cop? Bon Cop, Bad Cop. Oh, okay. You never heard of that? No, it's got, I haven't. It's got Col <laughs> it's got Colm Fuhrer in it. I basically the plot is is that um uh you got uh the, there's this body, I guess. Uh, I I've only saw it the once it was at the Silverway Film Festival, but this body, I guess, had been dropped from some height and it that was impaled on a sign. And half that half the body was on one jurisdiction, and half the body was in another jurisdiction. <laughs> so you had this uh, French and English cop that had to <laughs> come together to figure out this crime because uh, the body was on both their jurisdictions. <laughs> wow! And that's the premise of the story. Um, I gave you the the surface of it. Yeah, it's called, oh, okay. it's called Bon Cop, Bad Cop. Half of it's in French and half of it's in English. It was. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. But it's really good. I don't speak French, but thank goodness I had subtitles. But, right. But, right. That was but, a good invention. But, it, but Yeah. But it was, a, it was a really good film. And, of course, Porky's came out of here as well, and Meatballs. Porky's was Canadian? Oh, Yeah. Wow! It was our high, forgot it, about Porky's. It was our highest grossing film until <laughs> Bon Cop Bad Cop beat it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. And of course, uh, a hobo with a shotgun. That's that's one of ours too. Oh, uh, yeah, I saw that movie. That was a good one. That was a real good movie. That had one of the trailer park boys in it too. Uh huh. Yep. <laughs> yeah, old Ricky doesn't uh, end up very well. Wow, man. Now, now, Porky's is when I saw all the sequels. <laughs> I saw all of those sequels. Yeah, I'm sure Canada's real proud of those. I actually... Uh, I, I actually, be. I actually entered... That's a good movie. I like it. I actually good interviewed luck. the daughter of uh, uh, Nancy Parsons, who played the gym teacher. <laughs> right. Yeah, okay. she's passed away, but I had uh, oh, her... Okay. her I had her old eldest daughter on here do a tribute interview because Porky's is 35 years old, and I thought, well, we, we got to talk about that. So I had right. her, I had her eldest daughter come on and talk about her, and it was pretty interesting. She was she was quite the trooper in that movie. Yeah, yeah, she uh, had a pretty memorable scene, if I remember right, and uh, that's a uh, that would have been interesting to hear what her daughter thought of it. Oh, she thought it was funny. She what? She thought it was funny. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but you've also, uh, died. I looked uh, on uh, Internet Movie Database, you, you've done, uh, I'm hoping I've got the right Dale Hilton <coughs> here, but <laughs> you had mentioned to me over the phone that you did a couple of slasher films. Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah. Now one right, of them, uh, uh, Vampire Holocaust, is that yours? <laughs> yep, that's me. Are you proud of that? <laughs> uh, <laughs> why not? You know, uh, it was fun doing it. Uh, I got to die. Uh, I get to get eaten by vampires, and that's a that's a brag that not a lot of people have. 
Um, I have a funny story about that. Uh, they didn't have any uh, kind of way to clean up. It was that low budget. <laughs> and uh, uh, there was no way to clean up afterwards, and I didn't know it was going to be that messy. And the blood that they used was uh, pan. It was uh, corn syrup and food coloring. Okay. And it was in the summertime, and I've got long hair, and they spray just covered me in this fake blood in my my death scene and and i'm covered with it and the scene gets over and then it's it's a wrap they're done shooting well now i've got this syrup all over me and i'm like well what do i do and it's late at night and there's like a i don't know if you guys have quick trips or 7-elevens it was a little you know gas station store down the street and uh i went i was like okay it's dead it's real late. If this place is going to be dead, I'll just run in there and run to the bathroom and clean myself up in the bathroom. And I, I go to this gas station. I don't know what's going on. It's like Rolling Stone tickets just went on sale. There's a line going out. And, uh, you know, just this huge line. I get up. I walk in. I've got this fake blood all over me. And everybody looks at me. Just It just stops. Everybody looks at me, and they're like, and the guy at the counter, he's like, sir, do I need to call an ambulance? <laughs> and I was just like, no, nah, man, they're filming a vampire movie in the graveyard down the road, and 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 I got, and I'm done. I was one of the victims, and everybody just starts laughing. I wasn't even in comedy then. And everybody <laughs> just starts laughing. They buy you I drinks? Huh? They buy you drinks? <laughs> <laughs> it was a gas station. I didn't get any booze from it. No, uh, no oh, I thought, anything. okay, I... I... I forgot about the gas station part. It just yeah, sounded like yeah, you mentioned a lot of people. I was like, it sounded like a nightclub. <laughs> it, it was a lot of people in that gas station for some reason. I just remember I was like, what? The, the one night I come in, it's got to be packed. Okay. And uh, uh, so I go in, I go in the bathroom, and I, I clean myself up as best I can, but it's it's not working. And uh, so as I'm coming out, I'm leaving. And as I'm walking out the door, this little old lady's coming in, and she does one of those double takes and looks at me. And I, and I looked at her, and I go, it's okay. I just slipped in the bathroom. <laughs> and the guy at the counter just starts dying laughing. And it's one of those you had to be there kind of things. But uh, that was from the famous death scene in Vampire Holocaust, directed by Todd Sheet. And I uh, had a lot of fun doing that movie. Uh, did another one called Dead Things. Uh, I commit suicide in that movie, uh, and that's a real gross way to go. And um, what? Then, what? Uh, what, what, mo- huh? what? 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 How did you commit suicide in it? Uh, I played the guy that was the character. It was. An, it was. It was. Uh, oddly enough, I thought the script was pretty much like uh, Rob Zombie's House of a Thousand Corpses. Okay. Only, only done a lot sooner. <laughs> um, there's a lot of similarities to the scripts on those movies, but anyway, uh, uh, I play the guy. I'm, I, I don't know. I think I was Jimmy, and I'd rather die before I go back to jail. And they're arre- they're getting ready to arrest me, so I disembowel myself in front of some police officers, and they gave me some chicken guts and a real knife. And I'm like, oh, a real knife. Okay, this ought to be interesting. And I basically stuffed a bag of chicken guts under my shirt. They zoomed in on me, and I stabbed myself where the chicken bag was under my shirt, ripped it open. Blood and guts went everywhere. As far as gore, uh, it's wonderful. It's uh, <laughs> uh, acting not so good, just as horrible. You're not going to uh, win an Oscar? <laughs> I probably I probably should have got one. I uh, you know um, you know one of those tomato awards or whatever they are. Uh, Razzies. Ra- yeah, a, ra- a Razzie. You know. <laughs> uh, although I will say both of those movies are better than the Matrix sequel. Okay. <laughs> um, are are they better? Really are the... like, Whoa, this is bad. Um, and another one I saw listed was uh, uh, was it Kiki meets the vampires or something like that? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, another vampire movie. Um, that one was a lot of fun. Uh, part of it was made in France. Uh, I wasn't for that part. But uh, here's a spoiler for alert. Uh, okay. I play two two characters in that one. I play twin brothers. 
Okay. And uh, I play the the main one was a uh, wolf, the vampire hunter, and I get poisoned by a witch. And uh, it was very, uh, they played a lot on Scooby-Doo, so there's a lot of Scooby-Doo references without a dog okay. in, uh, in this movie. And uh, they go to the, this little group of kids, or, or people are trying to solve some goofy, goofy stuff is going on, and they're trying to solve and figure it out. And they go to their buddy Wolf, and uh, before Wolf can do anything, Wolf gets killed so Wolf, they go to Wolf's funeral, and a bunch of biker vampires show up, and so does Wolf's brother, Rolf. And uh, so I got to do a little cameo again, a cameo on my own character, I guess you could say. And that was a fun movie. I get my heart ripped out by vampires, a female vampire in that one, oh. by that character. I die twice. I die in every movie I'm in. Like uh, uh, <laughs> Steve, like Steve Buscemi in the Coen Brothers movies, right, <laughs> right, right. I don't end up in a in a in a wood chipper, or in an urn, or or in a co- or a coffee can. I'm sorry, what's that? Or in a coffee can. Right, right. I don't end up in a coffee can, but <laughs> I do get killed in everything so far. And uh, so I'm I'm looking for uh, more work, more uh, work to die in. So, so what was it like playing two roles in that one? Oh, it was fun. Um, it was it was fun. Uh, I got to wear a suit, uh, or at least part of a suit, and uh, that was part of my payment. The guy's like, "I'll buy you a suit. I need you in a suit." And I'm like, "I don't have any suit." He's like, "All right, I'll buy you one." I'm like, "All right." And uh, he didn't. He never really came through. He just kind of gave gave me stuff that looked like a suit. I'm like, okay. I had fun, but as far as the the diversity in acting, there wasn't a lot. It was more funny, uh, campy script, and I don't mean that as you know an insult. It's a silly movie. Uh, there's a lot of nudity in it. Um, uh, yeah, nudity well, parts. that must you must have <laughs> liked that. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, uh, and not me either. For so I don't want to scare off anybody. No, I'm that talking about the girls. The movie. What's that? I'm talking about the females. Yeah, there's a lot of girls in it, and a couple of them get naked, and uh, that's, uh, you know, um, let's just face it, naked girls are fun. <laughs> I don't, I, the women out there right now that are listening, I don't, I hope that's not chauvinistic, but man, applaud, thank you for all the times that you flashed us. I mean that with the greatest respect. Uh, <laughs> What's it like being on set and seeing a naked woman? Uh, you know, well, being from you know my background and being bat, you know, we're bouncing for bachelor parties. I saw a lot of naked women there, and uh, you just be professional about it, you know. Well, you I'm sure you like, were. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. I mean, it was the scenery was great, but you know, I wasn't going to be rude or anything, you know. And uh, uh, you know, I think that I think that gets you farther with girls, anyway. You know, I mean. Uh, you know, if I was on the set and she's naked, I would be like, hey, baby. You know, she wouldn't have wanted to have nothing to do with me. But, you know, and I, and I didn't have any scenes with any nude girls. But uh, No, you had those earlier in your career. <laughs> I did. I did. I did. I, uh, <laughs> well, be- between, <laughs> yeah. between the two movies, which one did you like better? Uh, Vampire Holocaust or, or Kiki Meets the yeah. Vampires? Yeah. You know... Um, honestly, uh, no disrespect to the Vampire Holocaust and the people that were involved with that one. I had a lot more fun uh, with the uh, Kiki Meets the Vampires. Um, I was for I got to go to the you know the premiere, uh, and they had one in Kansas City, they had one in St. Louis, and then they had one in France. Uh, and I went to I didn't get to go to France, but. Uh, the parties for that movie were uh, great. So I guess you can say I had a lot more fun with uh, the Kiki Meets the Vampires movie. Uh, this is, you know, um, I had fun doing the, the Vampire Holocaust. As far as the better movie, probably, that's a tough one. Um, if you're looking for horror, Vampire Holocaust was more serious uh, comedy. Uh, the funnier movie is Kiki Meets the Vampires. That's a funny movie. I haven't uh, heard of either one of these movies, you know, so they're getting a yeah. nice plug here. Yeah, 
I am. I'm gonna after I get done talking, I'm gonna call both the guys and go, Hey man, I just pinched your guys' smoothies that you made years ago. Uh <laughs> uh but uh yeah, they're unknown they're you know, they're little uh splatter flicks, uh, you know, had fun doing them. Uh I'm the only thing really big that I did uh was a uh hopefully so far or not hopefully, but so far the only the biggest thing. I was an extra on a movie with Michael Rooker. Okay. Uh, who was who is the guy that gets his hand cut off in The Walking Dead? Okay. And uh, one of the bald ones is in that movie, and I was just basically an extra, but the director was uh, trying to give me tell me what to do. Okay. And as he as he's telling me what to do, uh, William Billy Baldwin is standing right next to me, and he's got that look on his face like he wants to ask a question. And the director, who is from the East Coast uh, of uh, the United States, he's got that East Coast accent. And he's like, Mr. Baldwin, could you please remove yourself from the big biker guy's mark so he can do his job? Thank you. <laughs> and Billy Baldwin looks at me and he's like, oh, excuse me. So someone told the Baldwin to get out of my way, and I, I think that's a pretty good brag. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, uh, some people get a chuckle out of that, but... Uh, uh, that was a, that was a, that was a, and, and Michael Rooker was a really nice guy. Uh, it was a kind of a, that was also a low budget movie, but it was a bigger budget movie than the Splatter Flicks. But uh, as far as that goes, that, those are the biggest things I've done, you know, um, movie wise. Uh, I'm hoping to break in and get a little more, you know, that stuff's uh, always fun work to do. And uh, I guess, I guess you could say that movie is the only movie I don't get killed in. And, um, uh, you know, it's interesting. You were mentioning when we were talking about Kiki and the Vampire, and you're making the the Scooby Doo references, and you mentioned you had the background at the escort service. Do you ever? Here's something that was brought to my attention no more than I think two or three years ago. Uh, a couple of friends of mine brought this to my attention, and I thought <laughs> I thought it was pretty funny, uh, very perverted, but very funny. Was cartoon porn. <laughs> 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 and you'd never believe the amount of Scooby Doo uh, cartoon porn that there is involving uh, Daphne Blake. Oh, I bet. <laughs> was everybody's secret favorite one. Um, yeah, uh, cartoon porn. It's too funny to get. I mean, you can. I I there's another comedian that's got a. It's not a. There's another comedian that talks about giggling with a heart on. Uh, but uh, it, that's to me what uh, cartoon porn is. It's just to me, it's hilarious. It's too funny to get turned on, you know. I'm like, all right, that's nice. All right. Well, it kind of reminds on. me of that line in American Pie. And uh, I heard about cartoon porn way after I saw American Pie. That was in 1999. <clears throat> but American Pie had that line where they're going to school the next day and and the guy was mentioned that he watched Little Mermaid, and he was like, Ariel's so hot. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that was immediately what I thought of the first time I was introduced to cartoon porn. Another thing that I find funny, too, in porn is uh, a porn that's based on movies. <laughs> like, I yeah. remember the first time I saw the cover art for Foreskin Gump. <laughs> For what was it? What was the movie? Foreskin Gump. <laughs> or shaving Ryan's privates. Yeah. Uh, uh, to shave in East LA. Uh, there was uh, uh, the funniest one I ever saw was uh, instead of the cone heads, <laughs> it was called the dick head. <laughs> and they, yeah, it was it was the greatest. They had these prosthetic dick heads on their heads that. You know, gave the money shot, if you will. And then and, there, uh, that was hilarious. That was that was just too funny. That was that was almost like cartoon porn. They're Bonan uh, the Barbarian. Bonan, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, now now I'm drawing a complete blank on all of those. They, they, every like every movie that came out had a porn satire. You yeah. Know, uh, die hard on or something like that, or, <laughs> which is probably not good for a hard on. Um, uh, God, there's so many of them. 
Yeah. There was even one for the Adams family. I don't even remember what that one was. Uh, uh, Nightmare on Porn Street. Actually, no, uh, it was uh, a Nightmare on Dyke Street. <laughs> that, really? That's what it was called. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Freddie was cr- uh, ter- terrorizing uh, all these women. Nightmare on Dyke Street. <laughs> oh, gee. Um, one of the funniest lines I've ever heard was in a all female porno, and it was so. And it, they were clothed. It was the rare scene where they were both actresses were clothed. And I laughed so hard, I had to call. I, like, rewound it. It was the only porn scene I rewound where it had clothing. Uh, but the lady, she comes home, and she catches her two female roommates going at it, and she throws a fit. And uh, the two girls that are in the bedroom, one of them's like, oh, I better go make sure she's all right. And she gets up and puts a robe on and goes out, and she goes to talk to her friend. And she goes to put her hand on her shoulder to tell her it's okay. And her friend freaks out. And she goes, who? Don't touch me. You smell like a dumpster behind Long John Silver's. <laughs> and I thought I was going to faint. I was laughing so hard at that. I'm like, that's the funniest porno line I've ever heard. And uh, mean, but funny. I, 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 I listen to a lot of Howard Stern. And he's had a guest on his show called uh, Mr. Skin. Do you ever hear that guy? Uh, boy, that sounds familiar. He compiles every nude scene from uh, movies and television, <laughs> and he knows. Ex- I'm amazed uh, when he's on Howard Stern's show because he knows exactly the to the exact second where these scenes appear. And I guess he's got a de- uh, a database where you can look up names of actresses and stuff. And every time Howard interviews him, I know I feel like it's such a perv talking about this on here, but <laughs> every time Howard um, interviews him, it, it's, they, they have the uh, what they call the Anatomy Awards. Uh-huh. uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. And, and they have best this or best that. And I can't believe the stuff. I mean... <laughs> That that guy's yeah, come up with. Uh, that's a pretty interesting hobby, um, finding out where all the nudity nudity scenes are. You know. Yeah. Uh, I've uh, I've been curious to what movie had the first nude scene, and I'm sure that guy know can answer that question, and I'm sure you can find it on the internet. But I, I think it was a uh, I, I I was kind of researching it. I think it's a I, I might be wrong. Uh, I think it's a Tarzan movie. Oh, really? Yeah, and there's a Tarzan movie where Jane jumps in the water, and it's in black and white, and I think, uh, what's his name? Uh, was it Gary Weissmuller? Uh, that that Tarzan, I think that's his name. Okay. Uh, he he uh, uh, actually did that yell. He made up that Tarzan yell, and he actually did it himself. Anyway, Jane uh, jumps into the water, and they got one of those underwater cams, and uh, she is uh, in her birthday suit. In all her glory, and uh, uh, I, I remember why I'm like, "Wow!" So those are what boobs look like, and <laughs> and then my grandpa was like taking a nap in the chair, and he wakes up and he sees Jane swimming naked, and he's like, "Wow!" And of course, he looked at it too real quick and then turned it off. <laughs> oh, I got a story for you. I've shared oh, this okay. on here before. I've had a number of the Friday the Thirteenth alumni here on the show. And I remember uh, when I don't know how old I would have been, but I would have been in an early stage, an early teenager, you know, uh, 13, 14 mm-hmm. or something like that. And at 13 or 14, mm-hmm. you're not interested in girls. You're interested in guy things, you know, and that, that all that female stuff don't happen till later. But I remember I got baited into watching Friday the 13th Part 2. And there is a scene in it uh, with this actress, uh, Kristen... Uh, uh, Kristen Baker, I remember her name, uh, goes strolling into the lake. She's completely nude. And uh, that was the first nude woman <laughs> I'd ever seen. And, uh, yeah, leave it to, to a Friday the 13th movie to teach me uh, the, the, what a female <laughs> body looks like. And, you know, there was like two or three kills in that movie, and that was where my mother came in and turned the television off. Right. It's okay to kill somebody. Yeah. Shakes. Don't look at them naked. Don't look Probably at them. 
Yeah. But uh, standard. Yeah. But I was born in 1972, and I often laugh because, uh, well, uh, after I was born, like the, the year I was born, all kinds of X-rated movies came out. <laughs> the year I was born, uh-huh. uh, Fr- Fritz the Cat, Pink Flamingos. Yeah. <laughs> yep, Fritz the Cat, uh, Pink Flamingos, uh, Be- Behind the Green Door, uh, Deep Throat. <laughs> A last Debbie tango, on, huh? Debbie does Dallas. Was I out in seventy two? Oh, a seventy two. I, I, you know what? I don't know. I know it came right about that time. A last um, tango yeah. in Paris might have been seventy two as well. And I'm like, what were they doing when I was born? I was unaware of at that age. <laughs> they were having a lot of fun with cameras. And I love Fritz the Cat. Uh, I find Pink Flamingos very hard to watch. Is that uh, John Waters' movie? Yep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's a rough one. It's a weird one. Yeah, well, yeah, Fritz everything he does is weird. Fritz, yeah. Fritz the Cat was great. I love it. I, I actually remember. had uh, Ralph Bakshi on here back in January. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. I had a wonderful chat um, with him, yeah. The uh, one of my <laughs> Fritz the cat, he's going uh, to get, you know, he's going to go get laid from one of those raven, black raven birds. <laughs> and he pulls his pants down. The cat pulls his pants down, and the raven goes, "You ain't black enough, baby." <laughs> and I just that was, that was my favorite scene in that lot in that whole movie. You ain't black enough for me, baby. And uh, <laughs> you know what's weird in that movie that. You know, you get past the uh, the X-rated part of it, the uh, the time when that movie came out, and the racial issues, the cultural issues, and the the drug culture, and all that that came out in that movie. Uh, I mean, that that was there. It was, yeah. You know, but despite the controversy of the movie, it's like it kind of. Uh, it was very observant about what it was portraying. Right. Yeah. It, it, it really did touch on the time. I mean, you know, the well, like the, the black ravens were, you know, black women, you know. Uh, he's just some cool cat. He's a cat. He's a cool cat. The police in that movie being pigs. Yep. You know, every, every character in there is an animal, you know, and that was, you know, that was so... Uh, a pretty heavy statement for the time you know and and even you know nowadays you know uh you know to have a, a pig in a cop uniform that's a i like the rabbit that was on uh the the biker rabbit that was on uh heroin <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah gee that's not saying anything about methamphetamine is it no not that no <laughs> yeah. that rabbit just having sex with everybody that was a, that was great <laughs> yeah a good movie the young kids listening to this right now are going, what's Fritz the cat? Oh, what is that? He was the coolest cat ever. And, and you know, uh, it's weird. The stuff coming out now, like I remember seeing Team, Team America World Police on the theater and the two, that scene where the two uh, puppets are having sex. And I remember looking next to me, there's a total stranger, because I was there by myself, and this girl with glasses just had her hands up in her face, you know, and just peering over as you couldn't believe what she was watching. <laughs> Every once in a while, that in South Park, have, stuff you have, find. Yep. Have you seen the director's cut? Of what? That scene? Of Team America? Uh-huh. Oh, I don't know. I don't have that oh, on Blu-ray. Oh, <laughs> man. They, they purposely filmed a terribly dirty scene because they knew that the censors were going to say no. So they filmed it so they could, you know, keep everything else. How about, and, and, and the censors were, they were okay with it. They were like, Oh, you can't take, you can't put this scene. And they're like, okay, we'll take this out if we can keep everything else. And they're like, okay. And then they did it just for that reason. And, but it's, it's, it's uh, funny, uh, but it's pretty bad. And uh, I'll refer to uh, two girls in one cup. Uh, if if everybody knows what I'm talking about, there. Do you know what I'm talking about? No. Uh oh. Oh. 
Well, they get a little dirty in the the puppet sex scene that they cut out. Uh, it it, it uh, it's they get real dirty. <laughs> okay. Uh, bodily fluids dirty. Oh, okay, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. And, they, and they did that just because they knew it was going to get cut. You know what and, it uh, puts me in mind of? It's weird with the censors today, because back in 1971, you know, Clockwork Orange, uh, Straw Dogs, mm-hmm. and Dirty Harry, they were, like, banned in so many places. And uh, yet, 30 years later, in 2001... It's weird that Freddy Got Fingered only got an R rating. Why wasn't that an X rating, and why wasn't that banned? Exactly. And it didn't have no. any point or purpose, unlike those other movies. No, uh-uh. No. Uh, Dirty Harry got banned? Well, they did, I mean, if they're going to ban, there's some places that ban Tom, Tom Sawyer. Or Huck Finn and Tom Sawyer. I don't know where uh, uh, t- Dirty Harry was banned, but I know I know Clockwork Orange was banned in a lot of places, yeah. and, I, and I know that Straw Dogs. I believe Straw Dogs may to this day still be banned in the USSR. But I mean, Freddie huh. got fingered. Like really? Like yeah. How did that get, not get an NC seventeen? I'll never figure out. Yeah, yeah. That was, and it was a. I didn't like that movie either. Um, it was disgusting. It was just it was just an excuse to do dumb shit. Yeah. You know? Um or like or like like you couldn't make blazing saddles today. Nope. Uh you, you can't make that movie today. Um, you know, but yet Freddy Freddy got fingered got made, you know what it's weird it's weird it's weird what gets made and what doesn't get made. What gets accepted and what doesn't. And it's no. Freddy Got Fingers is an example where the censors failed. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I. I. Yeah. Very. Very good point. Yeah. A good observation. You know. Uh, I certainly wouldn't want them, my kids. You know, I don't have kids, but I would not want wanted them to see that. <laughs> That's okay. You're not missing anything by not having kids. I don't want kids at all. Right. <laughs> no. Ah, they're fun, yeah, but they're better when you get to go away. Uh, you know, uh, <laughs> um, I, no. I'm Uncle Dale. I'm Uncle Dale to a lot of kids, uh, but uh, uh, I don't have any of my own. Well, enjoy your freedom. Yes, and I do. I was gonna and, say, uh, um, do do you have like any stand up uh, gigs coming up? I'm going to be working the East Coast. Uh, I'm going to be in uh, Newark, New Jersey uh, real soon. Uh, wise guys, uh, I, don't, I don't have that, those dates in front of me yet, uh, but uh, I'm going to be working the East Coast here real soon. Just got done doing, doing a, uh, oh, I wouldn't call it a tour because uh, I'm not Rolling Stones. No. or anything like that but uh as far as a, a no-name comic like myself who by the way i really appreciate you having me on your show no problem and uh you know taking the time i hope i i hope for a no-name guy anybody that's listening to this far has been interested in having a good time well we're talking but, uh, about a lot of filthy stuff so <laughs> <right>. <laughs> like this is gonna be so one of the most talk, perverse talk, interviews i ever did <laughs> <laughs> right it's family entertainment folks yeah, like I, uh, uh, I just got done doing a little small tour, uh, not you know, a bunch of shows in a row uh, here in the Midwest. Uh, and here in, uh, uh, what is it, like two weeks, I'll be on the East Coast uh, working that side of the, the world. And um, I, I don't have any of my uh, dates in front of me, which is, uh, I would pimp those shows. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, maybe by the time this, this comes on, uh, you know, I'll be uh, out there uh, and uh, have a bigger name. You know, I got to ask this. I'm, you, since okay. you're a stand-up comedian, do a little bit of your stand-up on here. Give us a little taste of your your wit and your humor. <laughs> well, uh, as far as the uh, working at the uh, before I got into comedy, uh, I had two full-time jobs. Okay. Uh, at one point uh, in my life, I, like on those real, I worked at a self-storage facility. Okay. Yeah, like on storage wars. 
Okay. And uh, if I answered their phones a certain way, I would get a bonus. And at night, I answered phones for an escort service. And if I answered their phones a certain way, I would get arrested. <laughs> and sometimes I'd be so tired because I had to work these both these jobs back to back. I'd be so tired. I'd get my phone conversations all mixed up. And the guys would call me up at night, and they'd be like, hey, what do your girls look like, huh? And I'd be like, well, there's blondes, brunettes, redheads. There's busty girls, petite girls. Some are short, some are tall. Some are five foot five, five by 10, 10 by 20. You could park a bass boat in some of them. And uh, you think that's bad. Wait till the next day some little old lady calls you up, and she's like, how much are your storage facilities? And I'm like, $250 an hour. <laughs> She's like, well, for that price, I could sell my body. And I'm like, well, we're hiring. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> that, that's, that's my little joke about what I used to do. And uh, I got a chance to do some stand-up comedy out in Sturgis, South Dakota, during bike week. Okay. And, uh, yeah, I did uh, 49 sets in nine days outside in the heat in front of a bunch of drunk, pissed-off biker gangs. Oh. It was comedy Vietnam. <laughs> and uh, one year uh, I went out there, the bike broke down. I love Harleys. So they're beautiful bikes, uh, but they're about as reliable as Whiskey Dick. <laughs> and, uh, and if you ever get a chance to go to Sturgis, if anybody out there, you know, get a chance to go to the Sturgis rally, you'll notice very quickly that everybody out there talks like this. They all talk like this out in Sturgis. <laughs> That's right. I like my motorcycles. I can't ride one yet, though. I'm a 12-year-old little girl. <laughs> and uh, one of the cool things about being out there is uh, girls will flash their boobs a lot. And uh, it's it's cool when that happens, but unfortunately it's against the law. Uh, and uh, if a girl gets caught flashing her boobs in the city limits of Sturgis, they get a ticket. They get a if they, if a girl shows one boob, it's a hundred dollar ticket. If a girl shows both boobs, it's a two hundred dollar ticket. But if a guy shows his dick, he goes right to jail. <laughs> Believe me, I know. Bail was two hundred. Hundred dollars an inch. Uh, <laughs> a little bit of it that's a little bit of the joke it's uh it's a little bit of the act um i, I talk about uh you know heavy metal talk about you know i don't talk a lot about drugs uh everybody does i i i mention them i got a few drug jokes uh, i got a lot of heavy metal jokes i uh, went to see uh the band napalm death okay me and, me and my buddy dave we went to go see the band napalm death and it was great. If anybody likes that kind of music, they're, they're, they're a good band. But it's a trip watching those guys introduce a song. Because he's like, hello, we're from Birmingham, England. We're glad you're here tonight to indulge yourselves. This next track is entitled... <laughs> and my buddy Dave shits his pants. And he's like, Could you spell that for me, please? And, and uh, that's that's what that's what it's like at a Napalm Death show, and uh, it's uh, good for the whole family. Uh, uh, <laughs> those are that's that's a little taste of my act. Oh, that's some great stuff. Um, yeah, that that the uh, the English one you did kind of remind me of something out of Monty Python. <laughs> Speaking of brilliant oh. Com comics. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely Monty Python. Yeah, the Holy Big Grail, Santa, one yeah. of the all-time greats, Holy Grail. I think Holy Grail and Blazing Saddles are probably in the top five. I, I put Young arguably. Frankenstein ahead of Blazing Saddles. Really? Really? Yep. That's, see, that, man, that's a tough call with me, too. Yeah. Young Frankenstein was really funny. I, I, I got to go. Personally, I got to go with Blazing Saddles. But okay. either way, either way, it's a tough call. You know, well, Madeline's Frank Madeline Kahn really made Blazing Saddles. I'll tell you that. Oh yeah, her singing. Oh, she was great. Her singing. I'm tired. 
Oh, yeah. But I, I mean, I like Blazing Saddles, too. But when it comes to Mel Brooks, I think Young Frankenstein was his masterpiece. But, you know, it's to each his own, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, they're, they're, all of them were good. Oh, yeah. Did you, did you know Mel Brooks' son is the guy who made the uh, World War Z movie? I didn't or, know that. With, with the Brad Pitt zombie movie? Why was uh, Mel Brooks in it? <laughs> yeah, he should have been a he would have been a great cameo as a zombie. Uh, <laughs> but I mean, it's it's weird how it goes from you know, oh, his the dad is the the funny guy and his son turns out to be the zombie guy. You know, which, yeah. which I like both. I like both. Not a bad against those guys. And of course, Mel Brooks was married to Anne Bancroft, who was the uh, mm-hmm. the the one who seduces Dustin Hoffman. <laughs> And the graduate. Yeah, that's right. If you're going to be with a girl, that uh, you know, she was a, she was a hottie. There you go. You know. Well, you well, know, uh, huh? I, go I, ahead. I was, was going to say, Dale. Uh, well, we're, we're approaching on two hours here, and I'm going to tell you, it, <laughs> th- this has been entertaining. I didn't know who you were yesterday. And uh, Stephen Joyner introduced us, and I gotta say, I, I'm glad I did this phone call tonight. Uh, well, yeah, man, I, I really do. Uh, you know, I appreciate you guys taking the time uh, to, to to take the time out to listen to me. And uh, this is a it's been the best Monday night I've had in a long time. It, I don't know when you're gonna have this on the show. Maybe I shouldn't have said that. I don't know if it. Oh, no, that's uh, that's okay. I mean, we're in okay. a, we're in April right now. It'll probably not air until. Uh, either September or October, because I've got so many interviews. Like, I'm only on live on Sunday night, so, uh, and sometimes, oh, okay. de- depending on length, my show's two hours, so depending on length, I could play uh, either a couple hour-long ones or a uh, uh, full uh, hour and a half or two-hour one. It's all it really depends. Well, right on, you know. Yep. Uh, and for those listening, I, I forgot, it's Sunday night. It's <laughs> Sunday night, it's not Monday. There, I me trying to be silly and be. There you go. <laughs> we're we're Monday night airing on Sunday night. <laughs> right, right. We're 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 April, but airing in sometime in the fall. Right. <laughs> but uh, no, I gotta say this has got to be one of the most <laughs> perverse interviews I've ever done too. <laughs> Talking about escort services, pornography, <laughs> cuck holding, uh, you know, nudity, <laughs> yeah, all the good stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there you go. But uh, I I gotta say this this has been a delight, and you know maybe next year I may you know uh, when you get some more experiences going on, some little more stand up acts going, I may have you back on again. That sounds like it'd well, be great. a great trip. Yeah. Great. And uh, hey, you know I might uh, even though you didn't officially do it, I might uh, I might uh, look into more of that uh, pie fight or that pie challenge. Uh, that's that's an interesting thing for the suicide. Well, yeah, if, take know, part. I might, I might, uh, but know, it, it, uh, but if you if you take part, if you accept the challenge, it's called the Doubt Fire Face Suicide Prevent uh, Suicide uh, Depression Dep- Prevention Challenge. Uh, just look up Doubt Fire Face, and um, okay, it, uh, if you nominate, see if you can nominate people in the industry because I'm trying to see if we can get the industry involved because that's really what people want to see. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they do. They they really do. And uh, if it catches on, you yeah. know, um, but uh, it sounds like a, a really good cause. And plus it's pie in the face. Yeah. You know, you got to, who doesn't love pie? Yeah. And uh, <laughs> look, look, if so, Natalie uh, Wood can do it and she got it all over herself, <laughs> anybody right, can do God it. God bless her. Yeah. <laughs> anybody can well, do it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, all right, man. Uh, yeah, uh, and hopefully I can get a, get up there to Canada and do some shows. Uh, I'd, I'd love to do Canada. Yeah. Uh, I've, I've, I've actually heard the crowds up there are great. Oh, yeah, uh, they are. You know, and uh, so uh, if I'm ever in your neck of the woods, I'll, I'll call you and make you come down to a show. Oh, that'd be great. Listen, before you go, you mind doing a plug for my show? Sure. Yeah. Sure. Just state your uh, name. I, State your name. My name, of course, is Greg Gilbert. The show is Python's Paradise, and I'm in New Brunswick, Canada. Got all that? Uh, Greg Gilbert, 
the Python hyena from New Brunswick, Canada. There you I am go. Dale Hilton. Thank you for listening to the show. Is that... <laughs> that sounds great. Oh, I hope I did that all right. You did that all right. You did that perfectly fine. You know, this awesome. this has been a lot of fun. And uh, do, do you got any yeah. web page or anything like that you want to plug just before you go? Uh, you can look me up on YouTube, uh, Dale Hilton, uh, comedian Dale Hilton uh, on YouTube. Uh, also, you know, I'm I got a you know one of those Facebook accounts. I think everybody has one now. And uh, but uh, one of I got some really good comedy on the uh, uh, YouTube. Uh, and uh, you know, if you want to go check that out, or you know, friend me on Facebook. Uh, I'll do so. Just a regular guy right now and having fun doing what I love. You know. Well, I hope you can get on Stephen's Curtain Call show soon, and because uh, I'm sure he's going to love to hear some of these uh, uh, per- 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 perverse encounters as well. <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. He'll like it. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, D- Dale Hilton, it's been, it's been a real trip having you on here, and uh, I really uh, wish you the best of luck in the future. Just don't light yourself on fire like Richard uh- Pryor. <laughs> I won't blow myself up that way, man. I won't do it, I promise. You better you go. Thanks, Greg. Thanks, man, for having me on your show, man. I do appreciate it. Thank you. You're welcome. God bless you, and you have yourself a good evening. Okay, man. You too. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.